Welcome to the second video detailing my costume progress as I create my Metrocon 2015 Brains mascot, Professor Opal Hyden. Last time we talked patterning, and now we'll get into the nitty gritty with fabric treating and sewing. To start us off, let me introduce you to your MVP during this process, the iron. There are many different irons out there, but really all you need is a basic one with different heat settings. This guy will really assist you with things like pressing your seams, evening up hems, and keeping your fabric straight. Basically, if you want a crisp, professional look, then an iron is crucial. Always put in the extra time to treat your fabric properly, and it will save you future headaches. To begin your process, when you purchase fabric, make sure to pay attention to the care instructions listed on the bolt. Certain fabrics need to be handled certain ways, so please specifically pay attention to the heat settings and washing. As a rule of thumb, synthetic fabrics require low heat and cotton requires high, but do pay attention to the fabric blend in any care notes listed. I usually hand wash all of my costumes after I make them, regardless of fabric specs. Because of that, when I pre-treat my fabric, I soak it rather than machine wash it. But whatever method you plan to care for your completed costume, you should utilize to pre treat your fabric. If you'll be machine washing, then machine wash the fabric. If you hand wash as I do, then you can soak the fabric overnight. Separate the colors and fill a bucket with warm water and detergent. Soak the fabric thoroughly and leave it overnight. Afterwards, squeeze the excess water out of the fabric, but don't twist it like a washcloth. That could damage the weft. Dry in between towels or hang it out if you have the beans. When you dump the water, you can see how much excess dye runs out of the fabric during this. That's why it's crucial to soak colors separately. Your next task when pre-treating fabrics is to get your buddy the iron and align all the wefts. See, with woven fabric, you've got the different rows and columns of fibers, called the warp and weft. The weft runs perpendicular to the selvage, which is the rough edge you should never ever use in your costume. When cutting fabric out, always keep it away from the selvage. Now, it's very common for fabric to get tucked out of alignment, especially when you wash or transport it, so it's paramount that you iron it before cutting out your pieces. If you don't, then you run the risk of cutting out twisted fibers, which will result in pulled, badly fit, and unseemly pieces. When you do this ironing, make sure to go at 90 degree angles. Keep that weft nice and straight. This will also flatten out any wrinkles that would interfere with cutting your pieces. Trust me, take the time to do this step and save yourself the trouble of twisted seams and uneven pattern pieces. This will also finish the pre-shrinking job if you didn't wash and dry your fabric. When you go to lay your pieces out, pay attention to the fabric's stretch and facing. If there's a stretch to your fabric, like in my shirt and pants, then place your pieces in the corresponding directions. Typically, you want a stretch that goes around your body as opposed to parallel. Of course, there are always exceptions, just keep the stretch in mind when cutting pieces. Many fabrics also have a front and back side. It's usually much more apparent on fabrics with designs, but even solid color fabrics will sometimes have a right and wrong side. If you need two mirror pieces, then simply fold the fabric over into two layers and cut the pieces out simultaneously. As often as you can, cut pieces out to match this way. Saves a lot of time and headache. If you use pre-made patterns, then there will be a guide included that shows the most efficient method of pattern layout. This, like the noble iron, is your friend. Listen to its wisdom. If you have a rotary tool, then just weigh down your patterns and cut around them. It's easy and efficient, but the blade dulls easily, and they're expensive to replace. Scissors work well, but I would recommend marking the pattern outline with chalk before cutting out. You could also use straight pins to attach the pattern to fabric. Otherwise, cutting out the pieces with scissors will jostle the pattern around, and your fabric piece won't necessarily match. It's good practice to keep a special pair of scissors just for cutting fabric. Cutting anything else with it will dull or mar the blades. Keep extra pairs of scissors on the side for cutting thread, foam, plastic hair, or anything else. These are your junk blades, and they won't cut your fabric as smoothly and efficiently as a good quality, well-maintained pair of fabric scissors. Finally, keep nippers for trimming your thread and seam rippers for fixing mistakes or popping holes. The ones I have are very cheap, but you can also invest money in a good set. It's very important to keep nice, sharp blades around when you work on fabric and thread, otherwise things can snag and fray. Like in anything, high quality tools can make all the difference. Now, it's also important to make a distinction between woven and knit fabrics, because you'll use different methods to sew them. Make sure to keep a variety of needles around, both machine and hand. You want different styles and sizes to account for all occasions, and multiples because needles will bend or break while you work, and it's the worst to be stuck in the 11th hour with no needles. The best practice is using sharps for woven fabrics and ball points for knits. They are specially designed to sew their respective fabrics. Universal needles will get away with either, but I only keep those around for emergencies. Like before, you want the right tool for the right job. If your fabric is snagging a lot, then check your needle. It may be the wrong type or size. Be careful because you could damage your nice expensive fabric with careless preparation. If your fabric has a stretch to it, then you need to approach sewing it differently. A light stretch can usually be accounted for with careful pinning, but lots of stretch requires new methods. First, adjust your presser foot pressure. 
Less pressure will help the fabric stay straight. You can also purchase different feet for your machine to make life easier. A walking foot, or even feed foot, will move the top layer of fabric along at the same rate as the feed dogs move the bottom layer. Sticky or stretchy fabric will sometimes really need this. Otherwise, you run the risk of fabric stretching out of shape and looking twisted. Finally, be aware of the kinds of stitches you use to make your seams and hems. Most commonly, you'll use the straight and zigzag stitches. If you're like me and don't own a serger, then you can fake it with the right stitch. If you're sewing that stretch fabric, then you should use a zigzag to maintain the stretchiness of the seams. Alternatively, you could also work a little stretch into a straight stitch by carefully and evenly pulling on the fabric. Play around with scrap fabric until you find a setting that suits your needs. Now that we've got all that information out, it's time to get to the assembly. Let's start with the jacket specifically the tail flare. Achieving the look I want was a multi-step process, the first of which was patterning in extra fabric and seams along the bias. This allows for outward flare rather than a straight fall. Once I put the pieces together, I pressed the seams open with the iron, this helps you line up the corners and keep the results smooth and flat, and starch to the material. Keep in mind, I specifically chose a slightly heavy natural blend fabric that would take to starch, fusibles, and high heat. If I were to try these methods on the fabric I used for my shirt and pants, then I'd be up a creek, because those are very stretchy synthetic wick away fabrics. Fabric choice will make or break your cosplay even before you get to the sewing. I thoroughly starched all the pieces to get them crisp. Just starch alone will be great for small things like cuffs and collars, but in a long, hanging area like coattails, it needs a lot more. The next step is interfacing. Interfacing is great for so many things, and they have tons of different weights and types available. Adding it is important to keep the fabric sturdy and the seams open. I don't want the whole thing collapsing down into a limp hang. I'm partial to fusible interfacing, and for this case I chose a medium weight. Heavy weights are great for things like hat and purses, but I still want this jacket to move with me. I don't want it to be an umbrella. The interfacing did a great job starting the flare, but it's time to finish it with something much sturdier. The final step to achieving a natural flare is adding boning. I attached two long strips of boning to the very bottom of my jacket. The great thing about the kind I purchased was its casing. All I had to do was sew the casing onto the fabric, then feed the boning through it. Very convenient. This maximized the space along the bottom so the fabric simply can't collapse on itself. In conjunction with the interfacing keeping the fabric sturdy, this forces the tails to hang out and away from my body and maintain an unnatural curl at all times. If I really wanted to go for the umbrella look, I could have added vertical segments of boning along the edges and seams of the tails. This would really get them to pop out in a way. I chose to keep a slightly realistic form because I love the feeling of the tails flowing behind me when I walk, and I also want to be able to comfortably sit and pass through doors and crowds. So with that done, let's talk sleeves. Boy, sleeves can be annoying. Like I said in that last video, I could dedicate an entire entry into sleeve creation, but let's just hit the highlights. It's important to ease sleeves into your armhole, that way you have a better range of movement from the fabric. Start by adding a basting stitch around the sleeve cap. Tug the ends to gather the fabric along the stitch, then pin and sew the gathered fabric into your armhole. Fun fact, if you want ruffled, poofy sleeves, this is how you do it. Just add extra fabric for extra gather and the sleeves will be as poofy as you want them. I personally like a little poof in my sleeves, but you can add a very small amount of gather and fit the pieces together primly and smoothly. Again, this is important so you can have a better range of movement without the fabric catching and pulling uncomfortably. It's another step towards making your cosplay professional quality. Moving on to little tricks with the pants. Since we're talking poof, why not address the pant bottoms? It's a small detail, but it's very easy to achieve. If you remember my pattern, the bottom flares out wildly without coming back in. This flare I used to make a poofy bottom by sewing a smaller length elastic to it. I carefully pinned the fabric to my elastic loop so it's gathered evenly around, then just used the triple zigzag stitch to attach. This allows it to stretch around my foot while still clinging to the ankle, and all that extra flare fabric is now poof, easier than winning golden eyes odd job. I also used that method for a simple, comfortable waistband. Um, attaching elastic, not winning golden eyes odd job. That won't really help you sew pants. Once complete, these pants are super comfortable and flexible, and the wick away fabric will help keep me cool at the con. On a final sewing note, I want to talk buttons. My shirt has quite a few, and there are a couple tricks to making them look good. Remember interfacing from a few minutes ago? Yeah, you want to use that. Especially with a fabric as stretchy as this, otherwise it will just pull and look ugly. Interfacing strengthens the overlapping layers and helps the whole thing hang smoothly. Use two layers of fabric with interfacing in between, then sew your holes and attach your buttons. If you have a newer machine, then you can probably utilize a buttonhole foot to make perfect, consistent holes. You just put your button in the back of the foot and it will automatically size the hole. Make sure you change your stitch settings appropriately. Consult your machine's manual for this. Once the hole is stitched, use a seam ripper to open
open it. When you attach your buttons, consider if they are flat or shank style. Mine are shanks, which I find to be easier to sew. Make sure to anchor them to the fabric with some extra stitches on the back side. If you're using flat buttons, then create a little shank by sewing a few stitches into the fabric first. This gives it better maneuverability for passing through the buttonhole. That's all we've got for this video, but next time I'll tackle lots of little details, like trim, lettering, and even basic resin casting. There's nothing like some really sharp details to take your cosplay to the next level. Until then, if you'd like to see more of what I do, please check out Clever Disguises on Facebook and Tumblr, and now with Twitter and Instagram. I'm currently planning a giant convention-themed wedding, so there will be plenty to see in the upcoming months. There's also more on the Metricom mascot page, like lots of really great fan art. Hope you liked this video, so please comment anything you'd like to see in the future, and subscribe so you can see it.